uh, hello everyone. Uh, as we get started, or are there uh, any questions, uh, I guess, uh, period, about uh, anything uh, whatsoever uh, that might have been on your mind, uh, wondering, you wanted uh, to discuss something that has happened in the world, something that happened in your personal or private uh, life, or anything uh, like that? Right. Uh, are there any uh, questions about what we have uh, discussed thus far over the the past few weeks, um, particularly hey, last Sheldon? week as well? Yes. This is Rania. Um, I do have a follow up to what I shared with everyone last week. Sure. Um, the uh, museum reached <clears throat> reached out and asked for my phone number. And so this fella named Hugh, I forgot his last name, um, called me, and we spoke yesterday. And uh, he asked to hear what happened, and I t shared my story with him. And um, he agreed that the way things were said wasn't appropriate, like the revolving door or the. And also, he so he was the assistant director of security, and he shared that he's also black. And that he understood where I was coming from and that he needed to do more training or sensitivity training within his team. So, I mean, that was positive. Um, but yeah, I, it was, yeah, I, I at least had a chance to talk to someone there. So that was what I wanted to share. Um, I'm glad you did, Rainier, have someone to speak to, but you know, Sensitivity training is just like uh, prayers and uh, often uh, prayers and uh, whatever they call it after uh, we get shot by the police. Yes, that's how I felt too, but I was like, well, I, I just told my. Yeah, uh, thoughts and prayers, that's how it is, okay. But that, that we always get that. It, it's like that's their go to sensitivity training. How come you didn't do it beforehand? But anyway, okay, I'm done. Um, real quick, I did get, he asked about one more ticket. So I said, I'd never planned to come back. And he had offered them. I said, well, I'll take two. And maybe next time I'll bring my husband with me <laughs> when I bring the kids. But, uh, yeah, it was it was kind of a... You know, like you said, I felt it very fluffy, like appeasement kind of talk. So, any other uh, rep? This is Charles. I got a question. When these cops and stuff go to be trained, go to be trained, they be trained to shoot to kill. They don't be trained to shoot to wound. So, if they if they went, like I just said, went to train to to shoot someone, why they can't shoot them, wound them in the arm or the leg? You know that right there will stop you. Now I can understand if you was, if you had a gun shooting back at them, and if, that that'd be their life or your life. No, first of all, you're never trained to shoot somebody in the leg. Or in the arm. That's TV. And the reason you're not is because you're more apt to miss. You actually trained to shoot center mass to make sure that you don't miss. The other thing is that um, they. Why is it that their training don't allow them to shoot white folks? The white dude who killed the Africans in Buffalo. Um, he had a gun when they approached him and had killed people, and they didn't shoot him. So it, it, it would appear to me anyway, in my opinion, they are trained to shoot black folks. They are not trained to shoot white folks. So that's my assessment. I'm I, I, I would go further uh, to, to say that there are uh, deep down beliefs that drive them to automatically uh, kill uh, black folks. Uh, and, and 
in a way they receive all of the, the same training, but the way that they react is the natural, uh, in a sense, instinct, but those instincts are being powered by what they believe uh, deep down in terms of what is uh, threatening, what is not threatening, uh, what they relate to, and what more importantly, they view as being human and what they view as not being human or being a uh, subhuman or not as much a uh, human. And therefore it becomes uh, easier, uh, you know, essentially to use deadly uh, force in certain situations versus uh, others. Um, it's almost as if uh, immediately uh, in the moment, there's a benefit of the doubt that are lended uh, to certain uh, people, uh, no matter what uh, the physical action uh, would say, you know, in terms of otherwise, you know, somebody uh, equipped with a high power um, machine guns and to kill many people, still some type of way, there is an ability to see a human uh, where that is absent in other cases. But that's, that's deep, deep, deep uh, down to those individuals. And that, that also, uh, Charles, uh, unfortunately happens a, a, across uh, uh, race and color uh, is, as well. Okay, I understand a whole lot more, man. You know what you just described, Shelby? Yeah. The foundation of slave patrols. Um, just like the uh, Christian church has as its origin Catholicism, and it responds as does Catholicism of its training. Same thing applies to the policemen and the um, idea of slave patrols because that was their origin, and their purpose was not to shoot white folks, or well, it was to shoot black people. And regardless of um, who you are, you don't get too far from your roots anyway. And obviously they haven't, because they are still doing things that they have always done by their inception and that's yeah, and, and that can be seen uh, just, I guess, to make it a little bit more clear when you think about uh, the difference between uh, the armed forces and you think about uh, uh, police. Uh, police are supposedly there, I'm just meaning it in theory, uh, to uh, protect and to, uh, to keep order, whereas uh, more so in the military, the aim is to uh, destroy um, uh, annihilate, uh, 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 you know, some type of uh, enemy. Where the, the difference is, as it relates to the police, going back to the slave uh, patrols that you just uh, mentioned, in that particular scenario, there is a protection and order that is uh, going on. But generally speaking, it's going on for a certain group of people. And in the origin of the uh, slave patrol, the uh, threat to that uh, origin uprising and things of uh, that nature would have been, of course, uh, or was uh, Black people. And so now still uh, today, uh, Black people, uh, a lot of times in the, uh, in the eyes of authority, the hearts of authority, et cetera, uh, absolutely doesn't make it right, uh, still look at Black people as being uh, a potential threat. Um, and they believe it in their heart, even though they cannot uh, logically explain it or give you, a, what I mean by that is give you, a, 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 give a good reason why that is the, uh, the case. So there's a deep underlying uh, belief that uh, drives the, uh, the action in the same way that deep down beliefs that we may not be conscious that we have drive our everyday uh, actions as well. So part of the issue we've already, good, good morning. Uh, part of the issue we talked about a, a while ago um, has to re ha has to do with what's in our uh, quote unquote our, our DNA in a sense. If if blacks have in, the, in their DNA uh, things that occurred uh, to them uh, against them for hundreds and hundreds and thousands of years, then whites have in their very DNA 
that which you guys are talking about, the fact the, 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 the fact that they believe that they're not dealing with a, a, a human entity, uh, even though those uh, like Napoleon, like uh, what's his face, Aristotle, all those guys, they know what they stole from Africans. They know the knowledge that they had. Uh, they know uh, 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 that they were mathematicians, whatever. They knew that. But since that time, what has been driven into the DNA, bred into the DNA of non-whites is that they're dealing with, um, a, a, as you say, a non-human uh, entity, meaning people of color. And the one thought that I had about that as Barbara was speaking was the idea of even uh, in Medicare and treatment and things like that. Historically, it has been believed that Black people uh, have a stronger resistance uh, to pain. And that idea um, and thinking about uh, Africans in that way is similar to how, you know, one would think about an actual uh, animal uh, as well. Um, you know, in terms of as we're talking about being, uh, you know, subhuman. Uh, well, I have a question about that. Barbara, excuse me, it's Ron, y'all. Barbara brings up an interesting point. Uh, and just feeding off what, what, what you just said, Sheldon, um, can it be then, if, when you talk about Aristotle and however far you want to go back to this, can it be that it is believed that the atom, the original atom, was not human. Or uh, is is that what that boy meant when he said those out there will kill me? It, it, it does this go back so far that the attributes? Because you start talking about the mathematicians, and and we even know uh, that even indigenous people did brain surgery, they did heart surgery, they did, they did uh, uh, mapping out the universe. They did things that were above what we see uh, th that we can even do today. So how is it that you don't see them as being human? Uh, you see them as being different than who you are, but it, it, does this go all the way back to 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 that to the very beginning that those attributes that you we are describing is what they're seeing and they since they have stolen them away that that makes you not human so that you can I don't want to say feel superior or I I just think this goes back further than 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 uh there has to be a spiritual side of this that that started this and 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 to keep it perpetual for all these years for all these hundreds of years this has to be a, a, a spiritual thing it just it's it just more than you are not human because they know better they have to i agree with you Ron. um that's a different lesson. And the reason I say that is because when you look at Cain and Abel, we have to stop looking at them as people with proper names and look at them uh, as concepts, as um, concepts that are used to help us see what we are dealing with, what we are faced with in this realm. And Pain represents the attitude of selfishness and a desire to make its determination about who God is or who its creator is and determine how it's going to relate to it. And if I am permitted to use as an example uh, Catholicism, making that determination, and able being that the one who is seeking to um, 
itself the attitude of Cain to see who its creator is, thus seeing who it is. And the attitude of Cain recognizing that it made every effort to destroy uh, Abel, but yet Abel's blood still crying out from the ground, meaning that Abel's body may have been um, abused, but Abel still lives. And the concept of Abel is the concept that we face as Africans. Um, knowing who our creator is and desiring to uh, share everything we know and have with those who are unaware of that and being subjugated um, <clears throat> as a result of that desire. And it comes from, in the beginning, pure jealousy. And and that jealousy uh, morphed into uh, the thievery. And that thievery had to be protected. So the protective thievery, um, the idea of subhuman had to be brought into focus so that you can just uh, so that you can deny that you stole it but you created it and at the same time uh, take advantage of those of color because they are not so not so much doubtful as they are uh, respect they're respecters of life and desire to protect rather than to destroy so I, I can see that very clearly I'm done Good morning, everyone. Um, one of the a secret that I use to to uh, maneuver in life, and this is like the first time I've ever shared it with anyone um, or people. Um, I make an attempt to treat everyone, whether I know you or I don't know you, like you got access to my toothbrush or you can gain access to my toothbrush. Now, if you don't know what that means, someone got access to your toothbrush, they can do some things to you. It can be for good. It can be for not so good. And by making that attempt to treat people like you got access to my toothbrush or you can gain whether I know you or I don't know you, it keeps me in a higher frequency um, of, as some people say, stay on the high road. Um, and and in it, by giving, making myself vulnerable to a person I may not even know, I may be showing my submissive side or my Shekinah side and that could very well be opinionated. Um, yet, that's a, a technique that I use. So if I'm, and I do it with you all all the time, I'll say as a suggestion, that means I'm metaphorically twisting your arm for you to explore something. If you don't do it, it's not a big deal to me. If you do do it, it's not a big deal to me. Yet in it, I'm trying to reason with you. Um, and in some cases, I'll say, as a suggestion, that's something you can believe or leave. Um, I may say things, uh, this is opinionated. That means it keeps me on click because if you don't think like I do and I don't think like you do, I want to make sure I'm not the one who started the argument or the, the disagreement. So if I'm reasoning with someone and someone says, don't nobody think like that, I take offense to that. You just killed the conversation. Even if you were correct in what you said, people that have said that to me who eat off my plate for free, I'm like all the bills in my name. You think white folks going to put bills in a nobody name? So I take offense to things like that, but that's just a secret that I use to stay on the high. So if a person is struggling with leaving their server tip, the minute you put them in a position of that person has access to my toothbrush, 
you may, it's plausible. I'm not saying it's going to happen. You may leave a better tip than what you were going to originally give. So um, that's my little secret for life to that I stay on the high road. Do I fall off of it? Of course. Um, so, Reverend Richard, I hope you understand that because you come out of the restaurant and hotel field. You know, you I, I acknowledge my housekeeper. Uh, I'll me, tell my... Uh, my bad. Go ahead, Reverend. Go on. Uh, I do indeed uh, because that's how... That's where I worked uh, when I was younger. And... Um, the relationship with your server better start long before the tip. Because if your relationship doesn't start before the tip, you don't know what you're getting in your food. So uh, if you, to speak to that in relationship to, to other people, our interpersonal relationship has to start long before we get to a point where the metaphor that you're using, Sharon, too, works. Or have access to a toothbrush, um, that it better start long before that. If it doesn't, then everything else is in vain. And um, as far as we're talking, as much as we're talking about um, relationship with people, we're talking, we're more talking about concept that guides our relationship with people. And I, it, it's much, much deeper than who pays the bills and who name the bills are in. That doesn't matter. What matters is how how much do you really care about the person, whether the bills are in their name or not. And that is determined not by what you say, but it's determined by how you respond to them. It's, it's determined by how you treat them, how you talk to them, and whether or not, you enter into a give and take, or whether you simply are one of those people who do not see value in arguing, and you just don't argue. Now, as far as uh, the, the you are uh, saying, that's how you deal with things, especially with us doing this, your, our conversation. I hope you don't think we didn't know that. Uh, we're very much aware of that, and being aware of it. Um, that makes us also aware of how you communicate. And if we were not aware of it, that means that we would not have been paying any attention to the way that you communicate because people do not necessarily communicate the same way. Our communication grows out of your environment, uh, also grows out of how you perceive your life and how you perceive people around you. So we are very much aware of that, George. Uh, uh, in terms of um, uh, uh, how you communicate. Uh, and I hope that um, I have addressed not only the restaurant aspects of what you see, but uh, as a metaphor, of course, but also the um, the uh, in- interactions that we have with people. Thank you. Any other thoughts or questions on that? Yeah, I I I I want to follow up on on this because uh, I think what Sheldon is going to go into today uh, is is a part of what uh, uh, Rainier went through when when she originally mentioned her uh, that situation and even bringing it up today and and listening to the the beginning of this conversation. This lessons, these lessons today, it, it brings up my emotions in me. Uh, I, I I don't like, you know, you 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 work, you reach, we reach to a point where we, you're just kind of sick and tired, and 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 I, I do get emotional, especially when someone that I know uh, and care about is mistreated. That you know, uh, but. At the same time, I realize that this is an invitation. This is an opportunity to return to beginning. And what Pastor described 
um, you know, looking at Cain and Abel invites us to do that. And, and, and as, 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 you know, all the things that we see on TV, it's as dirty and nasty and as inhuman as things that we see, uh, all of those things may also fit in that category. Uh, so when we look at, again, the eighth sense and everything that has been explained, and as we try to understand that, I see all of that tied into this. Uh, the memory going back to Cain and Abel in the beginning, and 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 uh, you know, so we we can uh, we can I can use myself as an example. I can respond to it with my anger, which does nothing but fuel the fire and cause it to happen to someone else, or uh, use that energy to return to the beginning and say, where are we and what are we to do with this? So that to me is is the part of this that I, I, I think I, I would much rather see and uh, kind of all uh, kind of figure out or see what we're supposed to do with where we are now. The, 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 the chaos is, is everywhere. And uh, maybe, maybe, maybe it's the time for us to, uh, to, to see this. We, we, we are awakening now. The atom is awakening as we speak. So that's why I'm anxious to hear about dreams. And because and, I think all of that is the same energy and it's tied into the eighth sense. So, uh, but but thank you. That's all I got. Any other thoughts or comments or uh, questions on visuals of what uh, Ron just said? Well, I a quick question, just a statement based on Ron, what Ron said, and the, the whole relationship of Cain and Abel. Cain killed Abel, um, and then Cain fled. And I think Ron gave the lesson on um, Cain and Abel's brother that meant compensation, redemption, redeeming yourself. And I, what was the relationship? Okay, Cain killed Abel. However, what was the relationship between the third brother? Was the third brother present when Cain killed Abel? And if he was, what was that? I would never know because it may be an allegory or it may not be an allegory. Yet, was there a relationship between the brother that meant redemption and Cain? Did, did they have any kind of dialogue or anything like that? Him, him came after. Third brother came after. Um, if I may continue, children, with um, uh, the understanding, as I see it, of Cain and Abel, I stopped at Cain and Abel and did not go to the um, other, um, to Shem on purpose, because that, this is not the direction I thought we were headed, but however, we're headed in the direction that the questions lead us. Um, Jim. Yeah, oh, oh, keep your thought. Please uh, go on because I wasn't planning on talking about Cain and Abel, but at the same time, I am definitely talking about uh, Cain and uh, Cain and Abel. So say whatever it is that uh, you have to uh, have to say. Um, as I ex said earlier, how I am, am shown the story of Cain and Abel, I also see um, the concept. Shem uh, being the uh, hyphen between the two or the bridge between the two. And what I mean by that is I see the European mentality being that of Cain, the African mentality being that of Abel, and the mentality of all of the other indigenous people between the African and the Caucasian being Shem. And however... Yeah. Seth, Pastor. Yeah, Hello? yeah I, I'm sorry. I, I, I think uh, 
I just want just for sake of clarity, make sure no one confused that his name was Seth. I'm sorry, Seth. Yeah, uh, Seth. Yeah. I'm, yeah. 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 My my name my mind is already into uh, Noah's kids, right? But anyway, uh, Seth. I see Seth as being the bridge between uh, Cain and Abel, and um, Seth being the concept. Uh, of indigenous people, with the Caucasian being Cain, and the uh, able, the uh, African being the concept of Abel, because of the depth of spirituality uh, from from the African, and uh, the the, um, the superficial spirituality uh, with the uh, Caucasian, and in between that um, is the um, of the indigenous people who draw their spirituality from the African, but they layer it, and not all the time, but at this point in life, most of them layer it with uh, the Caucasian concept of not only religion, uh, but of greed as well. Thank you. I hope that helps. Questions about that? Post questions, comments. Maybe I should ask the question. Does it make sense? Yes, it does. Thank you. It makes sense. George, did that answer your question? Yeah. Yes, sir. Appreciate you. All right. So uh, as we continue, we're actually continuing in the same uh, discussion that we've been having for about uh, 35 minutes now. Um, Ron, uh, last week, um, asked the question when I said that we are here on this uh, earth in this uh, physical uh, reality of this physical uh, dimension learning abilities and how to uh, how to use our power and that is what we're doing here in this uh in this earthly uh realm and ron uh mentioned that he would like to discuss that uh more um in, in order to discuss that uh more it takes me to talk uh more, I guess, go more in depth about all the things that we've been talking about for quite a few weeks now. So uh, with that being said, some of the concepts that I'm going to uh, talk about may feel, uh, you know, quite uh, foreign and it may make you, uh, some of you feel a bit uh, uncomfortable, but it is still a nat the nature of who and what we are. Um, so before I get directly to Ron's uh, question, uh, first I want to talk about uh, us as, uh, in a sense, multiple uh, personalities. And if you recall back to the scenario, and for those who were not here, I used the pretend scenario of a child pretending that, um, you know, how we used to uh, play someone at some particular point, you've been a doctor, you've been a fireman might have been a police uh, officer, truck driver, a sports athlete, whatever, and playing with your um, your friends or even playing with yourself and make believe uh, in your head, you transfix your environment to that which uh, you need in order to play that uh, role that you're playing at that particular uh, moment. Um, but as we are doing that and you're playing that role, you're only being, in a sense, a portion of yourself to be that role. And you're also thinking about what it must be like using your imagination, what it may be to be that role, because of course you're not necessarily, at least uh, logically thinking, you're not, uh, you do not have the experience of being a doctor at that particular, uh, particular uh, moment. In the same way, we have multiple uh, titles that we fall under, multiple things that uh, we do whether that is uh, a child, a parent, husband, a wife, a sister, brother, 
um, a, a caregiver, uh, some type of worker, a cook, a friend. Uh, we are very, very multifaceted uh, as it uh, relates to all the different roles that we play uh, in a quote unquote uh, lifetime. And I'm kind of uh, freestyling, but also have some, some things uh, um, written down. So I'm kind of just explaining things uh, as uh, we go and may be incorporating directly things that I was not planning on saying, but things that were uh, mentioned uh, thus far uh, this morning. Now, when I talk about us being as, uh, as uh, multidimensional, uh, uh, multi uh, personalities, what I'm talking about is all of the carnations of yourself that you have forgotten are always a part of you. In the present though, we are more focused on the uh, part of our identity that we're most familiar with, which would be the one that's in this actual physical uh, reality. And our personality isn't just limited to this physical reality. This reality is just uh, one of many. For a quick context, the dream state is another reality independent of this physical reality, but no less real. Now, with that, are there any uh, thoughts or questions uh, as I go on? That is the, uh, the first thing that I need to make sure that we're on the same page with uh, personality. And basically what I am saying is the same way that you play, or we play multiple personalities in this physical room, is the same way that we're multiple uh, personalities outside of this physical realm uh, as well. The same concept. Okay. Moving on. But, oh, go ahead. And, but the Sheldon, I'm just asking a question. Sure. The difference is the one that separates us is the physical reality, right? Uh, or is that the one that feeds the rest of them? Is that the reality that we use that that the ego comes from that feeds the rest of those, including the dream reality? I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go further in that. So I'm definitely going to be addressing that that part directly. Okay. Any other uh, and, thoughts, questions? Go ahead. And Sheldon, when you when you use uh, when you say multiple personalities, uh, but when you first started talking, you were talking about our roles being multifaceted. So are you talking about both multiple personalities in multifaceted roles? Or are they the, the same? I am talking about uh, both. And just to give you, uh, I guess, not a, not a teaser, that's not the way I, I want to. Uh, just to foreshadow a little bit, I'm basically, uh, we're going to see where uh, you both came in, April, for example. For, for one. And then as I talk about, uh, this may uh, make people also feel uncomfortable. When I talk about when I mentioned uh, reincarnation, it means that that which uh, the abilities uh, that you have uh, worked on and strengthening, uh, et cetera, in uh, other uh, carnations is a part of you now. Yeah. Yes, sir. Take you back to what Barbara said. Um, oh, she asked rather. This idea of multiple personalities or a stigma that was developed in psychology. However, oh, yeah. Uh, oh, you mean? Oh, sorry. You mean in terms of like, yeah, from a psychological uh, standpoint, in terms of like different people, yeah, I'm not, I'm not, I don't mean like different, uh, different people. Go ahead. So, and that's exactly where I was headed because to mention multiple personalities, um, immediately our Western trained minds go through, go to that many people or more people who we are representing. However, um, could, but I think that the multiple, the thing that we call multiple personalities, are are actually a representation of us being one yet many. I am a little but I'm many things also. Um, the 
there are many Elohim. Elohim is not just one entity. It's multiple entities that are Elohim. And within those entities, uh, there are, uh, what I don't want to use that word personality as much as I want to use the word, uh, characters who are labeled by, by virtue of how they function. Does that make sense? Yes, and, and, and that that's better. Thank you for bringing that up, Miss Barbara. Yes, what I mean by that is multi uh, multifaceted, uh, more so when I uh, say um, uh, personality. So when you think about how multifaceted you are, uh, how how we are on this earth of who, uh, for example, who we identify with and who we think we are, and so all of those uh, things that I mentioned, for example, we are as multifaceted as much as we're familiar with, but at the same time, even multifaceted even more in ways that we are not always or not consciously necessarily aware of. But I, yeah, I don't mean different people at all. That, that, that whole concept, I'm, I'm sorry, go ahead, go ahead, Barbara. No, it wasn't Barbara, it was Ms. Formell. I'm sorry. I, uh, I, I'm need sorry. A, I need a little more clear. I want to see if I'm, I'm getting this right in terms of personalities or multifaceted. We are saying, as I am a mom, a daughter, a wife, an employee, that's my multifacetedness that I'm aware of physically. That's but I have other facets. That's that's what we mean by multi-personality, multifaceted. That's what I mean. The things that you are um, aware of yourself that is doing, like if you say, yes, my name is uh, Ramil, I uh -huh. am this, that, this, that, this, and that, and all the things that you, that you can actually name and you identify with, I'm okay. telling you that there are things that you are not necessarily uh, uh, just as aware of that you also right. are. Okay. Yeah. That, that that's what I mean. And so uh, and, and it's going to uh, come um, a, a little bit uh, more clear as I uh, go on. And if it uh, doesn't, thank you definitely, Ms. Barbara, for, for clearing that up because I was unaware that that's how that was, might have been uh, being said. But uh, definitely uh, we can come back uh, to this if there needs to be more clarity uh, on it. Quick question for Ms. Romeo. Um, out of the mother, the daughter, the worker, friend, if, if I'm naming them correctly, which one gives you the most pleasure? And, and the reason why I'm asking that, um, because there's a quicksand and there's a George. I favor quicksand more so than I do George. I see pleasure in quicksand. So out of what you named, you know, which one gives you the most pleasure, if that's a fair question? I think it's fair, but I see that question like somebody asking me, which is my favorite child? I don't have per se a favorite. It depends on the situation I'm in. I mean, for the most part, I'm selfish enough to believe that I like all of me. It's the dark side or the unsavory side that I, I don't even know if I want to call it unsavory. It's just the side that I don't know when it starts to pop up and I feel uncomfortable that I'm probably the most uncomfortable with. That's the best I can answer that, George. Hey, that's a good answer. At least you didn't say you didn't know. I can live with that. And this, Ron, I was just going to uh, help out a little bit because uh, if you remember or familiar with the hidden gospel, he calls them your community. Uh, those voices within that uh, you, you, you bring under, uh, he uses the word submission, but you make into one. You, you, give, you move to a place where those voices have... Uh, the, the same priority, I guess, the, the same agenda. So it, it, your your community, you know, and a lot of it, we we can look at as ego and as a mill, Ms. Will mentioned, uh, different parts of you being a mother, a father, whatever that case may be. 
but we still have those uh, that that community of voices where one you know might control your anger, one is your fun side, your laughter. So we we deal with as as Pastor said, just just a multitude of all. Uh, persona, I guess, or, or characteristics of, of who we are. So yeah, I, I, just just if, if that helps, that's just all. Uh, he 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 labels it as your, the community within that that you're trying to to communicate with. No, that that. Ron. Go ahead. Yes, ma'am. Go ahead. No, I was just thinking, Ron, for using in, in the, the word persona, and that that gives me much more clarity of understanding. Yeah. So I, I can use uh, that uh, going for, forward uh, if, if that helps. Now, the next uh, concept that we're going to that, but we're still going to be on that persona a little bit is consciousness. And the concept of consciousness, uh, the pillar is consciousness creates form. And this is going back to uh, Ron's original uh, question, or as we were talking about uh, last week, in terms of with our, uh, our thoughts and our beliefs and our emotions behind them, we actually create matter. We actually create this uh, physical reality, which I'm gonna go into uh, further. But that concept, consciousness creates form. It's not the other way around. All personas also are, are not physical. It is only because we are busily concerned with the daily matters that we do not realize that there's a portion of ourselves, our personas in a sense, that knows its own powers are far superior to those that we think of in our ordinary uh, existence or our ordinary, uh, 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 the, the ordinary that we are most familiar with. We aren't struck in some physical uh, reality where uh, this is all that exists in terms of this uh, physical reality and all that will ever exist with the exception of maybe a heaven or a hell uh, for those that, uh, uh, you know, according to how we used to uh, believe that we will join in some uh, future. Uh, that, that's not what all of this uh, is about. That's not what's all uh, going on. Uh, the first all this is, exists would be more so uh, a Western uh, thought at first and that of uh, science. And then the latter more so, uh, you know, well for us, for Christianity in our past that came from uh, Catholicism. Um, we cannot trust our physical senses to give us a true picture of reality. Our physical senses alone deceive us greatly to the point where it is easy to believe them without question. We are sometimes wiser, more creative, and far more knowledgeable when we are dreaming than awake. All right, to Ron's uh, question. We create the world that we know. We have been given perhaps the most awesome gift of all, the ability to project, project our thoughts outward into physical form. With the gift comes responsibility. It is fairly easy for us as human beings to congratulate ourselves, our successes and our lives while blaming God, fate and society for our failures. This leads to a tendency to project guilt and seemingly errors onto a God image and or Satan. The projection onto the God image many times uh, happens rather uh, subtly. Um, basically what I'm talking about is basically how we got to religion, how we believe, not taking uh, uh, responsibility for our actions. Uh, I've, I've noticed a, a lot since it started more so, I guess, this journey of, of awareness, et cetera, that, and we talk about it here all the time, the idea of religion can be crippling to the point where it's not us taking responsibility. And if we're not taking responsibility, then it's impossible for us to more so get the concepts of understanding that we're creating uh, our reality because we're not dealing with ourselves. We're not looking up, uh, within. Everything that we looked at is being uh, bad. So to the extent, extent we project that, uh, that outward. Are there uh, 
any thoughts or questions what I've uh, said uh, this far, thus far, excuse me. Yeah, I, I, I hate to, to, to keep asking a question on, uh, on top of uh, questions. Please, but... please ask away, Ron. <laughs> please. It's it, it, it a lot there. Consciousness creates form. Uh, that, that, that's, a, that's a mouthful. And, and uh, so I, I, I have a, I'm going to give you an example. I have a, a, a stomach issue, right? And okay. when I change, when I change, temp, my body temperature changes real fast. Uh, it has a reaction on my stomach. Why that happens, I don't know. But I expect it. And when I change temperatures, I expect this to happen. And I'm wondering, uh, am I causing that to happen? Because it happened once. And now I expect it to happen, and I'm creating that issue. Or uh, is, is that this? If is, is that a kind of on the line of what you're talking about? Is is that uh me being conscious of what what I'm used to with my with my body, and I'm causing this to to maybe even get worse than it really needs to be. And I'm just using that as an example. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> so if you look at it on a larger scale, you, you, you can say maybe the Africans' expectations are what causes the violence. When we say, oh, here we go again, or I knew this wasn't going to stop. I mean, are we, is that part of what you're, what you're talking about? It, it it is, and so I'm just with that uh, with that question, Ron. I'm just going to continue to, uh, uh, to to read, and if anyone else has any questions, uh, just please stop me. But this is uh, basically me going on to address uh, Ron's uh, question, and it'll be a little bit uh, other stuff as well. But so I'm going to continue with uh, consciousness and how it works, and uh, answer that question. Okay. Hey, Sheldon. Yes, sir. Uh, may I offer an Aramaic understanding of dreams? Uh, sure. Um, the writer says that Giliana is the Aramaic word for revelation, and it implies vision and dream. The root is gla, and it means to uncover, to unveil, to reveal, to lay open, to declare to show and to make known. So the spiritual purpose of a dream is to open us up and uncover things to us so that we become aware. However, um, we have been taught that dreams are simply things that happen in your life and they have really no meaning. And I think when our attitude towards dreams changed in our attitudes towards what Ron was talking about will also change. Just because this is hap has happened before and just because it's happening now does not mean that it has to continue. Um, suppose for a moment that the, uh, the um, I, I don't know how to describe it, but say the illness or the dysfunction in your body that you're talking about, Ron. Suppose that um, it is an, a, a visionary effort to show you uh, what's happening so that you can make sure that it doesn't uh, continue, continue in the future. And could that be done by virtue of you um, changing your attitude towards it as you did with um, the job situation? And seeing everything around you shift almost immediately. Does that make sense, Ron? Yes, sir. It does. It does indeed. It does indeed. I'm uh, I'm listening to this. Thank you. Um, this is Richard. Can I jump in here for one second for Ron? Help him out, maybe, or give him an idea. 
Ron, I, I, um, there are a couple of things I'm hearing that I haven't heard in years, and that's because we're all, we're not the same group we used to be, so I don't know where people are in terms of what they read, studied, thought about, in terms of Aramaic, in terms of the book, and the whole notion of mind in the matter, et cetera, which I well remember. But more specifically, Ron, I would suggest that you take a little time and look into the concept of chi and your lower dantian, which is your stomach and lower abdomen. Uh, you'll find in there some interesting and maybe useful explanations of how that part of your physical body um, holds, controls, and works with various emotions or things that come to you or come to your body. Could be heat, could be cold, could be happiness, could be sadness, etc. Anyway, that's just a suggestion. It's been there for a thousand years. And um, I think it's worth a study or just looking into. Anyway, thanks. Thank you, Richard. So I'm going to start off uh, back on consciousness, but Ron, I'm going to go into uh, uh, the, the body as you uh, as you asked. Um, bear with me. So consciousness is a way to perceive the various dimensions of reality. The physical senses allow you to perceive the three-dimensional world, and yet by their very nature, they can inhibit the perception of the other equally valid dimension. As human beings, we mostly identify with our daily physically oriented self, again, the self that most of us are the most familiar with. We would not think of identifying with one portion of our body while ignoring all the other parts. However, this is what we do when we imagine that the egotistical self carries the burden of our entire identity. We are not some random offshoot of matter that resulted in a uh, happen chance human being and we don't all of a sudden die and then cease to exist. We form the physical body that we know at a deeply unconscious level with great discrimination, miraculous clarity, and intimate unconscious knowledge of each minute cell that composes it. I don't mean this figuratively, but literally, because our conscious mind, our thinking logical mind, is not aware of these activities. We do not identify with this inner portion of ourselves. We prefer to identify with the parts of us that watches television, cooks, works, drives, etc. The part we think knows what it is doing. The seemingly unconscious portion of ourselves that we aren't logically thinking about is far more knowledgeable. And upon its smooth functioning, our entire physical existence depends. This portion of consciousness, excuse me, this portion of ourselves is conscious, aware, and alert. We are so focused in physical reality that we do not listen to the portions ourselves. We don't understand that it is the great physiological strength from which our physical oriented cell springs. We consider this seemingly inner unconsciousness the inner ego, for it directs inner activities. It contains the eighth sense. It correlates information that is perceived not through the physical senses, but through other inner channels. It is the inner perceiver of reality that exists beyond the three dimensional. All necessary information is given to you through these inner channels and unbelievable inner activities uh, take place before you so much as lift a finger or blink an eyelid. This portion of you is naturally clairvoyant, uh, the ability to perceive events in the future are beyond normal sensory contact, the telepathic, excuse me, and telepathic, capable of transmitting thoughts to other people and knowing their thoughts so that you are aware of disasters before they occur. Whether or not you consciously accept the message and all this communication takes place long before a word is spoken. So before I go uh, further and to, uh, to answer your question, uh, more Ron, it is the uh, inner uh, ego, um, what we would, uh, well, in uh, the Bible is considered as the uh, Holy Spirit. As we're talking about, and we will see later, later we're talking about uh, Abel, that dictates your, uh, our bodily uh, function, um, directs all cells and all matter uh, is uh, conscious. And all of this is uh, taking place naturally without us logically uh, 
uh, thinking about it. Regulation, uh, the release of uh, serotonin and uh, other chemicals and things like that, that are also uh, directed by our uh, thoughts uh, and feelings. All of this is being directed by our uh, inner selves, how our heartbeat. Uh, our, all our different uh, nervous systems, uh, breathing, uh, et cetera. That is part of our identity. That is a portion of us. We just don't look at it in that particular, uh, in, in that particular manner. Questions or thoughts at this particular moment? Again, Sheldon, if I can add an alternative way of looking at it if it helps, because I think a lot of this is not what's right, what's wrong, it's what resonates with you and at different parts of times of your life, different things can. No, no one person or being, entity, necessarily had the concept so right that it can be explained once in one way for all persons at all times. So if you can, some of the benefit from learning some of this some from what other people have studied and developed helps you to maybe look at it a different way that finds a way to resonate. In this case, I would offer what Jung called the shadow self. It's basically that part of that ego that we don't see anymore because in the course of growing up, we pushed it all out of our consciousness self, but it's there, it's real, it walks with us on our shoulder or beside us if you like. And so it interacts with our, what we recognize as our physical conscious self and can cause things to happen. So part of the challenge and what I think we're doing here in our own way is to bring that shadow self, which by definition is in a dark darkness, not negative, just a dark place, bring that into the light so it can be more consciously, um, what? Um, I want to say you wrap your arms around it and make it part, make it recognized to be part of you. And then with that awareness, move more so into a better understanding of yourself and it all. Okay, how it all works. So anyway, I just suggest another way and a, a way to go at this is to look at this concept of shadow self. I'm not asking you to go take a course in psychiatry. Uh, just look it up on Google. And if it helps to open up an understanding of what Sheldon is saying using a different language, then that's that's the offer. That's what I'm suggesting. Okay. Yeah, the, the, the point is that uh, this is uh, who we are. It's just not necessarily uh, who we always think of ourselves uh, to, to be. This is not tapping into some uh, reservoir uh, that is uh, separate. It is you. It is uh, you who uh, create your body. It is you who uh, regulates uh, your body um, while at the same time focusing on the, uh, the physical. It is uh, you, and I was going to get into it a little bit later, but I guess this isn't necessarily going in, in, uh, in, in order. It is uh, you, for example, who controls your breathing, your heart pumping, your body regulation, digestion, uh, sweating, et cetera. It's the inner senses, uh, uh, um, the eighth sense, when I mentioned uh, Rania about your uh, son having that sense, but having no logical uh, thought or thinking that was put together for him to have that uh, feeling. It was just automatically having a, a feeling and a knowing in a sense that hey, this is not a great um, place at this particular moment, kind of uh, sensing a danger or sensing something that was, uh, that was uncomfortable. Um, when we have uh, hunches and things of that uh, nature, it's not something that usually comes, for example, in a sentence, it's not something that is spelled out, it is something that just happens immediately and uh, you know. And it's done, it will be even impossible from a logical standpoint to even think uh, that quickly, you just uh, immediately uh, know. Um, and uh, like I said before, this is more so associated um, uh, with uh, ABLE. So now that we have established what the inner ego is, we will go to the uh, uh, 
the outer ego and the, the outer ego and the inner ego operate together. Um, the one to enable you to manipulate in the world that you know, and the other to bring uh, those delicate inner perceptions that our physical existence could not be uh, maintained um, uh, without. Uh, that outer ego, and as we discussed and talked about earlier in terms of uh, those group of people who have oppressed uh, for uh, hundreds of years, that has been a concentration on the outer ego. That has been um, that particular, those individuals being cut off from uh, their spirituality or cut off from their inner uh, senses and looking at the earth as being that's it. And so I must uh, survive and there's nothing else uh, to it. That is what the outer ego does when it is, excuse me, my voice. That is what the outer ego does when it's cut off from lung disorder. Chip, uh, may I ask a question in regards to those uh, two explanations of ego? Yes. So ego is actually the mediator between consciousness and subconsciousness, the outer world um, or the uh, material world and the spiritual world. It mediates between those two. And what I mean by mediate is that it keeps it, it, the, re, the responsibility of it is to keep us balanced. However, when we um, see, uh, when we think that we are more important than anyone else, then we call that being egotistical because um, we are no longer relying on our on our subcon uh, on ego to uh, reveal our subconscious to us. We are simply relying on it uh, to fortify our um, external, um, our material, physical uh, perceptions of self. Does that make sense? Yes, that, that makes uh, a perfect sense. And so what I had, excuse me, written down by the, uh, the outer ego is the outer, excuse me, the outer ego is a jealous God and it wants its uh, interest served. The ego meaning starting off from uh, uh, the outer, that which we are most familiar and working, working our way uh, inward. It does not want to admit uh, the reality of any dimensions except those within which it feels comfortable and can understand. And think about uh, Cain uh, as I uh, read this. It was meant to be an aid, but it has been allowed to become a tyrant. Even so, it must, uh, excuse me, it is much more resilient and eager to learn than it generally supposed. It is not naturally rigid as it seems. Its curiosity can be of great uh, value. If you have a limited conception of the nature of reality, then your ego will do its best to keep you in the small and close area of your accepted reality. If, on the other hand, your intuitions and creative instincts are allowed freedom, then they communicate some knowledge of greater dimensions to the most physically oriented portion of, uh, of your, your persona. In the uh, example of uh, Cain and Abel, is a situation where Cain annihilated uh, Abel for his own uh, survival. Whereas uh, in the same way, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit isn't there to dictate or make you uh, do something from the Aramaic understanding of it. Uh, what the Holy Spirit uh, there is to do is to uh, aid you and uh, help you and assist you in the same way uh, that our inner senses, when we're talking about the inner ego, um, when we talk about the uh, eighth sense, um, we talk about, forget the word you just used, uh, Pastor Richard, just now, but being spiritually uh, connected is there to uh, aid us. And, and what happens with the, uh, uh, when someone is just relying on their outer ego and, that's, and, and that alone, what happens is it thinks that it needs to survive on its own, so to speak. It must take everything into its uh, own hands, and it doesn't recognize or see where the inner senses are there to aid it uh, and, and help it. We finish at the moment, uh, but you go well at the moment, yeah. 
Pastor Richard. Yes, sir. Okay, I didn't know if you had comments on what I just said. No. Any other thoughts? Not yet. Oh, any other thoughts or comments at the moment? No, I, I think that you're covering it well in terms of um, uh, taking those things that that we have seen from a psychological perspective only and um, introducing us to the reality of their existence based upon the spiritual uh, entities that we are. Even when you um, um, spoke concerning the attempt by Cain uh, to annihilate Abel, uh, that in itself uh, speaks to uh, ego out of being out of control, or and uh, or ego that is unaware of its spirituality or, or subconsciousness, uh, wherein Abel was aware of both and. The thing that, that uh, attracts me so much to, uh, to the theory, not theory, to the, uh, the um, concept of Abel and how he responded is that there is no evidence, to my knowledge anyway, of uh, there being a struggle to keep Cain from killing him. It, it, it's, um, it's almost like Abel, it, it was like the, the African in that, the African uh, put up little resistance, but for different reasons, because it has the African has experienced uh, the brutality of um, of the of the Caucasian of a cane. Yet, and now we have been at a place, and still are, for that matter, of least resistance, of fight back, or when it comes to the brutality of those who. Um, whose uh, ego is out of control. And our ego has re remained intact in that we have always sought to bring everything to a resolution uh, through the spiritual realm. Even though we were misled about it, we still made an attempt to do it. We believed that prayer was the entrance into the spiritual realm for change. And we used prayer as the primary element to guide us uh, so that we would refrain or continue to refrain from um, submitting to the um, brutality of our enemies or being as the Caucasian is in terms of having no value on life. So um, I, I think that this discussion uh, carries us uh, to a um, much, much deeper place in terms of understanding our spiritual nature than um, than we realize at the moment. So um, I, I'm simply um, processing uh, as you speak and seeing very clearly uh, the the uh, not different, uh, but the um, comparative ev comparative evidence of it being of this idea rather. Uh, of um, ego uh, being something that has been um, misguided, misunderstood, mis mistranslated uh, um, by those who uh, do not understand uh, the origins of um, what they're attempting to to uh, talk about, um, to, attempting to teach, especially when it comes to psychology, uh, because psychology and the counseling of others. Uh, I, um, Western psychology has does not reach the African. Um, Western principles of um, counseling does not reach the African. Uh, the what I found through uh, through counseling is that principles of counseling is predicated on the depth uh, of your care for humanity as well as uh, your desire. Uh, to see everything through the eyes of the spirit. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I have a question. Yes, ma'am. I'll wait if you want. We're going to respond to Pastor 
Mm -mm, go ahead. Um, as you guys were talking uh, and, and talking about Cain annihilating Abel, blah, 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 could it be that, and Pastor, you made the comment where you didn't see where uh, uh, Abel, you know, re re responded in kind or uh, put up a defense, if you will, against uh, against uh, Cain. Uh, could it be that once we understand that we are spiritual beings, that then we understand that energy uh, doesn't uh, doesn't you, you can't do away with energy. In other words. If we were thinking of Cain and Abel only as physical entities, uh, we don't see where Abel is able to be resurrected. But from a spiritual perspective, then, if, you, if you're looking at Cain and Abel as attributes of the same person, say, uh, and that thing that we suppressed uh, so long within ourselves is almost like... Um, tantamount to killing it when we don't allow it to 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 take a life and 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 and, and rise up in us but when we understand spiritually that which we suppressed meaning if i am if i am uh, of, 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 of a race uh, uh, that that that's not of color i, I suppress all of these things within myself, I suppress thoughts of uh, the African being uh, the same as I, the African being my brother, the African coming from the same source as I, I come from. In, in a sense, it's almost like annihilating and killing. But once I'm spiritual, I'm open to everything that I am. I'm open to my relationship with the universe and the unicity within the universe. That thing that's within me can be resurrected. And um, and so uh, I don't have to be stuck in this um, reality, this physical reality of Cain killed Abel and that's it. In other words, I, I, there's always that that opportunity to 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 to, to resurrect that portion of myself, connect with it, and and move on. And I'm not sure that resonating, but I, I, I can, I can, I see what I see, but I'm not, under, I'm not sure I am relaying to you what I see. What it sounds like you're, you're, you're saying, which I am in agreement with, is that it wasn't that Abel was ever annihilated or destroyed. It was simply that, uh, Cain did his best to separate only mentally um, Abel in a term. So uh, in, his, in his head, in a sense, through that separation, Cain killed Abel, but Abel never uh, went anywhere. And uh, with the concept of the, uh, the inner senses, the uh, inner uh, ego, uh, Abel isn't even uh, physical uh, anyway, and we know that it cannot die but uh, is that which is uh, creating um, uh, the, the body, so to speak. Uh, it, it is one that is controlling um, uh, the cells, like I said before, cell regeneration, all the processes, literally every biological uh, and chemical uh, uh, reaction that takes uh, place uh, in the body uh, to make the body in a sense uh, animated or a living uh, entity in the physical reality. That is what uh, Abel is doing. Cain just simply cut itself uh, off from that, but uh, did not destroy it. Go ahead. I agree. I, I um, if, see a, a picture of it that um, leads me to the place where the personalities seeming to exist. Um, what I'm saying, I'm making an attempt to say is that the personality or the 
concept or the attribute of Cain as an able. That's Rich, if you're still uh, talking, you're going out. Okay. Every time I attempt to talk, I get static. The, um, the last thing we heard was the attributes of Cain and Abel. The attributes of Cain and Abel, as well as Seth, are attributes that were in the spiritual DNA of um, the African womb that brought all mankind into existence. And that being the case, then, those attributes were ferried out into different people in that the exit in the African womb are uh, these uh, concepts or these attributes were housed in, in different bodies. Uh, the dominant the dominant um, attitude was that of Cain, uh, that of our Seth and Abel. Why do I say that? Because the youngest uh, 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 concept of, of Cain is in the Caucasian, if you look at the, the way it functions. So the further uh, the physical being removed itself from its origin, uh, the less it felt the unicity with um, its creator or the womb from which it exited. And the the less affinity it had for that womb, uh, the more it became egotistical in that it esteemed itself greater than anything that it came in contact with and because of that ego being out of whack, saw the earth as uh, its possession and saw everything that inhabited the earth in terms of humanity as its servants and possessions. Uh, so when I look at it uh, from that perspective, I see that this whole story of um, Cain and Abel or actually speaking to what was housed uh, in the mind concept of the of the original womb from which everything sprung. And I think that it was necessary for this to be in keeping with um, Isaiah 45 and 7, where it speaks of who created light and darkness. I think it was necessary for this to be in order uh, for the entity brought into this earth in a physical form uh, to to uh, become as its creator is, and the beginning of that is recognizing the um, spirituality uh, uh, and embracing it. But more than that, is understanding that the image and likeness is uh, the key uh, to bringing. Uh, a sense of understanding and awareness of the spiritual nature of all of us, bringing that to the consciousness, uh, to the attributes of the um, the, the uh, descendants of the Cain attitude, or the ones who have embraced it and held it tighter than has anyone else in the earth. I hope that makes sense, and I think, in Barbara, that may uh, coincide with what you were saying. It does it. Yes, it does. Okay, I'm doing this. In, in, in other, in other words, it 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 tells us again not to take the stories literally as if they physically happen. That there's more beyond that. Because if we took what physically happened, and we believed that Cain killed a- Abel, and that was it then we would not have the opportunity to, um, for anyone to recover that attribute, that part of itself uh, that was 
that was able, that was uh, uh, a, a channel, if you will, uh, in, in, into another reality of who we are, a broader, more expansive part of who we really are. So then, if I'm understanding what you're saying, uh, the, that was necessary that that there be a confrontation, if you will, with your inner and outer ego, so that you can grow into an appreciation of who you really are. So the the emergence of self is not so much a third entity as it is a opportunity to bring the two Cain and, and Abel together to work in unison for the same goal. Is that fair to say? It is. Yeah, yeah they're, the, they're the same. They're one of they're the same entity. They're one and the same entity. Yeah. yeah. And it's, Ron, it's, it's like, I think you started. Go ahead. Ron, this is Richard. I, I, I don't think you have to use such a harsh term as confrontation, but yeah, I, about, I yeah, get that's what, exactly what I, that's exactly what I was about to say, Ron. It's, it's, it's not no, a, a confrontation. Yeah, the whole thing about this is there are no winners and losers. The dark and the light, you know, it's not the good and the bad. And ultimately, the objective anyway is to know the wholeness of your being and to walk in that. So it's really inviting the, that other self and finding a way to converse with it, certainly in a peaceful way if possible. Otherwise, if you deny it, it will show itself. It's there. It's your shadow. It walks with you from the time you were born. And the hard part of this is before you were conscious of so much, it was already forming based on all the external pressures that were that you internalized into your being but anyway what you ultimately want is to bring it just think you want to bring everything together make peace with it if you want not deny it and if you deny it you see all the aberrant behaviors that go on in this world um that's that's part of a confrontational kind of notion um but and if you deny it enough you'll get extreme behavior kinds of uh, outbursts which happen all the time as well and people kind of don't know what they're doing but they they're giving into that okay i'm maybe going in circles here but i'm just trying to we got to let go of this winner loser good bad i think um confrontate it's that whole competition confrontation thing that we can just let go of and nothing was is in us or given to us that's call it negative, so to speak, in the sense that that suggests, in my view, and in my experience, at least in my journey. Yeah, you, I, I, I agree totally. I, 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 it, it goes back to, as Pastor said, uh, Isaiah 45, uh, one, one side defines the other. You, you good and evil, is is relative into in each and every one of us. It, it it defines the balance, and that may look different to each and every one of us, but it is it is necessary. Yeah. This is for Mel. I have a question here. So then, are we saying Seth is analogous to balance and harmony within our inner and outer egos? I think Seth is indicative of the people in the middle who are being pulled to and fro. An example of that would be uh, the, okay, the Japanese were put in, intern, in, in uh, internment camps um, during World War II. And they were treated just as bad as we have been. However, when they came out of those camps, what people don't really realize is that they would, when they began to when they began to wage war against the country, and I mean that metaphorically, uh, to get compensation 
for having been put in those camps. Um, the lead, part of the leadership in that quest were African Americans who helped them accomplish that. While at the same time not getting any compensation or expecting any uh, based upon what happened to us. So I, I see that as, uh, uh, sorry, let me finish the, the, the uh, concept. Then what happened? Then you have the Japanese who um, look down upon the African, and knowing that it has been treated uh, in a similar manner, not just for many years, but in a similar manner, and is looked upon in the same way as people of color look upon by those who are currently in charge of the world. So I see that, Vermeil, that says, it represents that concept. Look at what the Chinese have done. The Chinese have moved so far um, away from their their natural cultural beliefs. They move so far away from it until they are unaware of what it looks like now, because they are trying to mimic, or they are mimicking rather, the Caucasian. They are mimicking the Caucasian. They are mimicking Cain, and in doing so, um, they are trying to hold on uh, to their quote-unquote spirituality, and as I do say quote-unquote spirituality. If you look at the origin of, of religion, or origin of spiritual beliefs, I should say, if you trace them, what you will see is that the entrance into the, um, the uh, area of um, Asia, the interest into that area by the Kushites is what brought uh, continuity uh, to, to nationhood to those places, as well as a sense of spiritual being. So there is there is a, a, a tug of war internally uh, that goes on with Seth making an effort uh, to be spiritual, but at the same time to remain relevant uh, to those who are the abusers of them, if that makes sense. It does. So let me ask one more question in lieu of all that. Can Cain and Abel, metaphorically, ever find peace and unity? Yes. Yeah, when Cain and Abel find peace and unity, Seth also finds peace peace and unity. And Cain and Abel are searching, not searching, Cain and Abel are on a journey to bring that unification. Every single time that uh, we are engaged with uh, the um, congregation in California, that is another step along this journey to bring that kind of unicity. Am I talking about every single individual? No, I'm not. And that is the reason I'm speaking conceptually, because it does not include every single individual. However, it does mean that the, um, the soul of the Caucasian is being touched or awakened in a way that is unbelievable to them. Uh, they never saw it coming, and that is the reason they are subconsciously recognizing it, and they call it being woke. They see what's happening, and they are. And Cain is making every effort to hold on to what it deems to be power and and control. And in doing so, uh, it is de- it, it making an attempt to demonize the awakening of the Caucasian soul so that it is receptive to uh, what it was created to be. And at some point, I will probably uh, go uh, tie all of this into um, the, um, the Garden uh, of Eden and with um, Adam and Eve. But uh, Richard, does that um, answer your question? Yeah, because I, I, in my own journey, 
I, I have to believe, I, I don't mean I have to make myself, I mean, it's just there and I'm recognizing it. It's just all about getting to wholeness and completeness. And, and we use different names, different concepts. People make careers out of specializing. You know, as much as I admire Carl Jung, he didn't, he wasn't the be all do all, but he helped like others to present things in a way that maybe you hadn't quite seen before that sort of, oh yeah. And then that helps you get to another level. But I think this whole journey is how to get back to wholeness. I don't think we've ever left the garden. Uh, we're certainly doing our best to ruin it, but I don't think we've, it's all, all been there. The question is this whole thing of how we perceive ourselves and all of that. And as that's changing, which is why I, I sit and quietly listen to all this talk about Caucasians, but I grind, I grip my teeth a little bit, but hey, it's okay because it's not what I believe I am, even if physically I can be seen that way. Certainly had enough confrontations and meet in, in meetings in my life where my, my fellow people, so to speak, have completely misjudged who I am, but okay. So it's just all this journey. And that's what interests me. Um, and that's what I see this as oh, helping us to see is happening. And then the trick is to find yourself in that. Where are you in that? And again, we've said before at Foundation, it's not a competition or a contest. And it's not like Sheldon's farther down the road than I am, or my son is farther down the road than I am, whatever. You're on the journey. If you recognize that there's no beginning, ending, it's just the joy of the journey and getting into what it reveals to you and how you can take hold of that, if you will. Okay, sorry, that was a little longer than I thought it was gonna be. <laughs> I, I, I can see, I see that because first of all, um, we are not dealing with individual corporations, we are dealing with concepts and those who perpetuate the concept. Because quite frankly, when um, I spoke of um, the, the um, attempt to demonize being a, being a woke, being a, the awoke generation rather, the attempt to demonize that comes from the Mitch McConnell's of the world. And I don't see you def as a, a, a perpetuator of the concept of Mitch McConnell or, or Trump and those, you know, those people with those concepts. That's what I'm saying. So we have um, always made every attempt to speak conceptually and regardless of um, uh, how disconfronted it is to us or anyone else, we have to speak uh, what we see. And that is one of the reasons um, I speak so, and others, of course, speak so adamantly about the idea and concept and reality of what melanin is and what it does and the necessity of it uh, in life. And when it comes to the, since you mentioned the garden, when it comes to the, um, the concept of the garden, you're right um, in that we've never left it in terms of our misunderstanding of it. However, I see the garden also as the same concept, and that concept uh, uh, as a part, rather, of the concepts that are in Cain and Abel. I see that. I see the, um, the in that I see the, the beginning of, of the, the uh, chauvinistic attitudes of men. I, I, in that male attitude, I see it as the beginnings of, um, of the um, misogyny of men. I see that. I see it also as the beginnings of a disregard for the essence, uh, for the, uh, the power and the status of femininity. I see that. I see it as the beginning of a denial of the source of life, which is that African womb, I see all of that, and I also see it um, in the, through the eyes of those now who are, uh, are making every attempt to forbid abortion. This has nothing to do with the right to life at all. This has everything to do with uh, that maleness out of that garden who blames everything on the woman and seeks to control the, the feminine energy. And the control of that feminine energy is we got to have more white babies. 
and 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 that's the that is the prevailing. That is the number one reason uh, that uh, we see this effort uh, to um, end abortions because we have to make we have to make sure that white women have babies. But this um, politician in Louisiana said that our paternal death rate uh, would be next to nothing if it wasn't for black women dying. And he thought he was making a point in, in terms of um, um, being correct in what he was saying, but what he was doing, that's a racist statement. It's a statement that says we are killing black women uh, who who are uh, who, when they die in childbirth. That's all he was saying. So all of these things are um, brought together speak to the uh, a, a concept that racism, misogyny, um, chauvinistic attitudes were inevitable. And the inevitability of them did not come without remedy, without a remedy. The remedy for these con- for these concepts is the, um, the the spirituality of the African and the embracing of the feminine as it never has since it's been in this country. Um, what I'm, I'm saying is that when I grew up and I watched athletes uh, on TV, it was always high mom. And that was a recognition of the depth of the, the soul depth of embracing the essence of femininity and respecting the womb that you exited. I, and I, maybe I said too much, too. However, um, it's done now. So are there questions or comments, or does it make sense to you guys? Thanks. Uh, it makes it makes sense. And all those things that you uh, just uh, mentioned, uh, forget exactly how to, the name of the connection, but if you want to uh, think about it uh, this way, and uh, to, to the point, Pastor uh, Richard, where it's not talking about, of course, all white people talking about concepts, is uh, something similar to uh, uh, Western uh, thought as well as that of the East of those of indigenous people and uh, those from the, uh, from Africa uh, throughout the centuries in terms of being more uh, comfortable uh, and in close and intact with their uh, spirituality. And so acknowledging and interacting or being uh, more consciously that part of themselves uh, as well. And the equivalent of that, as you mentioned with the uh, chauvinistic is the idea of Western uh, thought is to um, uh, the um, indigenous thought as uh, the man, the chauvinist, uh, the over-reliance um, of the ego and masculinity uh, is to uh, femininity in terms of both of them trying to be in power and not operating from um, the inner senses, or not just uh, not operating from the inner senses, but going back to Cain and Abel, uh, completely uh, denying or acknowledging, uh, I would say, is existence. Not that it doesn't exist, but the, uh, denying this awareness of it, uh, of its, excuse me, the failure to acknowledge um, its existence. And uh, Richard, when you mentioned last week, um, uh, white people uh, guilt, that uh, in itself, and not directed to you, but just in general, is based upon an overemphasis uh, and identity with the, the outer ego and failure to identify uh, beyond that uh, existence even subtly and therefore uh, fight to survive um, its environment, um, you know, selfishly. Uh, and it always perceives that violence and annihilation will come uh, upon itself. So also the idea of Cain um, uh, killing Abel was the idea that Abel was a a threat, uh, number one. And then number two, the perception that he had to do that for his own uh, survival. Thank you. 
again, I think you can say, if I'm following this correctly, so you, you, I find myself thinking, wow, what would Cain have been like without Abel or Seth? But totally off the rails. But that's again a perception, right? Yeah. yeah well, well, that's the, the what Cain has defined himself as is what brought that on. Correct. So, for example, in our identity, and going back to uh, when I agree with you, when uh, Ron accidentally said uh, a, a confrontation, all of it is part of an identity. Is no difference from us, like I said earlier, denying that a certain uh, part of our body is part of our uh, body. So when we started off, we started talking about um, identity and personas, uh, et cetera. Um, and to, how do I wanna, I wanna say that? Okay, so this is what I uh, wrote. The self that you know is only a fragment of your entire identity. The fragment cells are not strung together like bees on a string though. They are more like the various skins of an onion or segments of an orange and all connected through to the same living uh, life-giving origin and power and growing out into various realities while springing from the same source. And this isn't to compare uh, your personas to an orange or an onion, but to emphasize that these things grow from within uh, outward. So in, in that sense, the outer ego is just as important as the, uh, the inner ego. It is just that they are working in unison uh, together. Um, so going back to the, uh, uh, how we got here to begin with, um, when I made the statement that we create uh, a matter, we create the physical world. In the same way that uh, our inner uh, senses in the way that even that we think automatically dictate how uh, our body operates. And what I mean by that is start doing something uh, like uh, worrying or having a lot of stress and anxiety and things like that. And as an effect, uh, your uh, body as a result in terms of what we actually are creating is not as uh, healthy as uh, self. At the same time, if we start uh, thriving from a, a mental uh, standpoint, uh, et cetera, our body automatically, um, uh, uh, I don't want to say manifest, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? It reacts uh, in a certain way because we are in a sense, even though we're not consciously, well, logically thinking, hey body, grow properly, uh, you here, grow some cells, you here, all right, we need to, uh, some cells need to die off, I right, put blood, et cetera. All of those things are actually um, uh, taking place. They are working together. Um, as it uh, relates to the outer ego and our thoughts and beliefs, as we become aware of that and uh, or aware that we're working with our, uh, inner, um, our uh, inner ego, we're able to create uh, outwardly. In the same uh, in the same exact way, but these things actually take uh, place slowly. In the uh, dream state, uh, which uh, Pastor uh, mentioned, a lot of things take place in terms of our body uh, being regulated uh, as well, and different balances and uh, things like that. Also, as I mentioned, in terms of the multiple zones, are not just being in this three dimensional uh, reality. In a sense, we leave this physical earth our body as we are in uh, the dream uh, state. We work out uh, problems and things uh, in our physical life uh, in the dream state. All of these things are connected, but we were looking at them as being separate. I think that was Ron who mentioned how um, indigenous people around the world had done things like map out uh, the stars or live in a, a jungle in the most, the most diverse area of the world with hundreds and thousands of different types of plants, but automatically knew exactly what plant to go to, to cure or help with some uh, illness, when even if they had gotten the wrong plant, boom, they're dead uh, in, a, uh, in an instance. All of this came from that connection that we're talking about with the inner senses. And a lot of times these things were actually communicated in the dream state uh, as well. I'm finished at the moment. I was just trying to tie in some of the uh, loose ends uh, and the stuff and making those connections to other areas. And all of that is the eighth sense, all of that that you just described, yeah. 
that that's where we are now. That's that's the reality we're we're in right now. We're moving to. So, Ron, when you say or we're saying the eight cents, just just tell me what what is. Just give me a simple definition of what you mean by that. What, what, what I what I see is we are, and I, when I mean we, I mean we are are moved to uh, all the those who are seeking truth. And I'm talking primarily about people on the phone. We're moving to a place where we're no longer reactive to things that happen in there. We're no longer uh, sitting back as, as being submissive, not being aggressive in any kind of way, but moving towards your spirituality, recognizing who you are, recognizing the energy that goes with that and operating in it, operating in it, knowing that these things happen for a reason. And there is a role that you play in all of this. And part of what I'm seeing is um, this this tug of war that goes on in earth. I have thought it for a while now, but I'm seeing the how-tos of it. It involves the, the European and African, and everybody else just kind of gets caught up in it. But the essence of that, the spiritual energy of that, no one uh, has really taken the reins of it. No one has tried to understand it. Uh, and, and these are a part of the greater things. That's why when we look at what it means to return to beginning, when we, we look at, uh, you know, when he said something about, or when Les talked about the memories and, and operating in, in a place where you tie all those other physical senses together, uh, that, that just kind of resonated with me. That's where we are. Somebody in the earth has to take that responsibility and, 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 and to see that everything that happens has a spiritual beginning and uh, 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 is uh, uh, waiting for someone to take responsibility for it. So I, I, I totally, 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 everything in me believe that's where we are. And I want to live that way. I want to see it that way. I want to be the Elohim in there and I want to know how to function as that in an everyday so when i see i think all these kids you can't pick up the paper now all this, my, my phone pings constantly all day because somebody else just got killed somebody else something just ever happens and that is no coincidence so what are you going to do about it human what are you going to see what do you see elohim so when, when he said that this is the proving ground for that, and he may not have used the word proving ground, but when we start talking about the dreams and S talked about memories, I see all that as part of the same thing. So I, that, that isn't a one sentence thing. I don't know, and, and if anybody can help me with that, I, I don't see the journey that we're on. I don't see it as 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 being just a haphazard thing that we're learning about truth. And even you, Richard, I see you as being a part of this. Why? Because you, you mentioned a, a, a second ago, a few minutes ago, uh, uh, that it, it bothers you that it, it, in, in a way it, it, it's supposed to. And in a way it's going, that, that, that part of you that it bothers is what's going to move you in one direction or the other. There are, if, 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 I, if we are correct in what we see, and this battle is a battle of energies on two sides of the of the number line, if you will. And there has to be a meeting in the middle. There has to be someone of the European descent, and, and I and I applaud those in California, and I applaud you because you have stuck with this all these years. So there's something you're seeing here. This there's something that 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 you're seeing that is touching you, other than. Or, or, or just gaining some understanding of it. You are seeing the racism in the world, and I hope that it's becoming sensitive to you. You are seeing the things that we talk about in politics and the things that are going on, and I hope those things are becoming sensitive to you, that you, you, you see now that it does not take every European, it does not take every African to see this. It only takes a handful of people that want to see change that want to be the people that we are designed to be, that want to be the Elohim in the earth. So that's why, that's why this has me excited. When he said that the other day, and even when, when Pastor talked about Joel, and we, I went back and read Joel, I'm like, whoa, 
I see similarities of us in this. I don't understand it all, but I see what, what uh, th- th- there's something there that I don't see. That part I see, if that makes any sense at all. But um, th- that, that's where I see us at right now. And I think each and every one of us that plugs into this phone, whether you just breathe or you open your mouth and say something, we're all a part of this unity that is being built in the earth to move the energy in one direction. That's what I see. That's my hope. Yeah, the uh, thoughts or questions? I um I I agree with, with Ron, and and I do believe what he just described is not as much of a definition as it is an experience that you have, whether you're conscious of it or not, and the uh, consciousness of it is because you want to be made aware, you desire to to um have this experience. The subconsciousness of it is what was described at the onset of the discussion about the eighth sense, and that was when we talk about, I knew I should should slow down. Something told me a police was down the road. Uh, that's the unconsciousness of it. But the consciousness of it is what makes it a daily experience. Thank you. Thank you. And what I was uh, attempting to do and why I uh, said I needed to explain all of this uh, stuff ahead of time is going back to uh, uh, addressing Ron's uh, question. I needed to make it comfortable or at least address the idea of going further into the eighth sense uh, to the point where that was uh, embraced um, and and for us to look and see and identify beyond uh, our own physical uh, bodies so that we could see uh, in a a sense this underlying thing that was actually uh, taking place and to uh, know that that, uh, and identify with that underlying thing and know that that was was us that was controlling all of these things, for example, uh, with uh, with our body that we have been uh, maintaining all of our uh, physical uh, life. And now to add on that to that in terms of creating a reality, now I want to uh, uh, mention as a thought, those indigenous people who uh, do things uh, like uh, have uh, rain dances and things of that nature in helping to uh, balance or uh, I don't wanna say get, get from the earth, but work with the uh, earth uh, to get things um, uh, that they need, but it's more so uh, done in unison and uh, done with, because there is an understanding um, of that uh, that connection and what is actually taking place. Uh, the manipulation of, 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 of the physical uh, world. Uh, when I think of now, uh, or how traditionally how we look at uh, sciences, we just look at things as just happening uh, uh, randomly when that's not so much of the, uh, the case. Uh, science is uh, more so the reaction, uh, the, the conscious uh, reactions uh, of things uh, being acted upon by demand, uh, so to speak, but in a creative uh, way. And to rely on the uh, outer ego is to not understand that and to feel like uh, there has to be some type of manipulation um, of physical reality uh, in a sense, because that uh, knowledge and understanding is, uh, is cut off. But I, I hope that uh, brings uh, some, some insight on uh, who and what we are and how we operate uh, in this uh, physical reality. Any thoughts or questions? It it, it does. Thank thank you. I, I'm a, a lot said today, and I'm I'm chewing on all of it because I don't quite get all of it yet. I'm go back and listen to the CD, but I I am seeing this. I I think uh, 
the and, and this is what you just said and and what Richard asked me as well. I think above all realities is the fact that there is no such thing as time. It was a theme put there so that you could come into the ultimate awareness of who you are. And 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 that's what I'm 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 seeing or hoping to see anyway. Uh, Elohim points to that. There is no time in Elohim. The human points to that. The human ties up everything we talk about ancestors and and those who are in front of us. The human ties all of that up. Uh, the eighth sense ties all of that up. When when all of it collapses into one, uh, being uh understanding dreams as you are, are, are talking about collapses all everything into one into the here and now into the presence so the, the present rather so so that's what i'm i'm, I'm seeing and, and 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 uh this is unraveling to me uh and, and bringing understanding to everything that we've studied so far and even talking about the, the how to's and and uh so yeah, I'm, I'll go back and listen to that because I, I really want to get the things you said about the ego that I, I, I I'm you know I'm kind of slow. You, you you say things and I get off on on the raft for a minute, and uh, my mind contemplates. And next thing I know, you moved on to something else. So I'll go back and listen to some of that stuff and and uh, pick it up and and uh, so I can have some questions. But thank you. Well, I, it I makes agree. sense. As it relates to time, I wanted to say something else right quick, since you mentioned it that I mentioned, but I looked at it uh, in terms of language and the eighth uh, sense. So I wrote a note on how the inner senses um, and eighth sense work in comparison to the logical mind uh, with a language example. So how we uh, think and how we uh, talk. Languages we typically know it is rather slow affair letter by letter strung out to make a word and words to make a sentence the result of a linear thought pattern language as we know it is particularly gra grammatically um the end of excuse me the end product of our physical time sequences we can only focus upon so many things at one time and our language structure is not given to the communication of intricate simultaneous uh experience um when we talk about uh, the dream uh, state and we talk about time. And I mentioned earlier about things coming to us uh, instantly uh, in a moment, uh, that time factor does not exist. Uh, when we fall into yeah. a dream or when we fall into uh, a, a daydream, for example, and within that uh, daydream, and let's say, for example, you have only been out within a daydream, which essentially is at no particular moment, you've been out of this physical reality. And that could have been for two seconds or a second. And in that uh, amount of time, what has actually transpired uh, taking a uh, place has gone far beyond a earthly uh, two seconds. That is something that uh, happens all the time in itself uh, shows how, um, you know, time is just uh, literally a uh, three dimensional uh, physical uh, earth uh, concept or thing. If any, if everyone should be able to uh, to um, relate to what um, I just mentioned and have experience with that. Oh, that that was all I had to say right quick about uh, time and uh, space being um, of uh, like the rules of Earth. Thank you, sir. I um I I, I like one. We said a lot today. I would uh, suggest very strongly to all of us to um, listen at this again. Um, if not in time for tomorrow, at some point, because there is a wealth of understanding in what we've talked about today. And I like, like Kathy, some, if I don't understand it, I embrace it. And the reason I embrace it is because I um, I trust the integrity of those who are presenting, raising questions, and responding to questions. That's how.
how we move um, in this earth. The disciples did not understand what Jesus was saying. They were forced to leave the upper room. That didn't mean they they understood it, but it means that they embraced it anyway. And that's where we are at this point. You've tried everything else, and religion hasn't changed anything at all. Let's see how much embracing the nature, the essence of who you are would change you and the environment in which you live. Thank you. Yeah, I'm done for today. Anyway. Are there any other thoughts or questions? This is Ramel. I just want to say thank you to everyone for today's conversation because I think it's really helping me to peel back a better understanding and a better being, Elohim. You're welcome, ma'am. You're welcome. And I sincerely thank uh, all of you for your uh, questions and presence uh, as well because uh, my main objective was to try to uh, um, to, to get us to uh, embrace this uh, more. And as we get more, uh, um, I want to say more uh, familiar, as we embrace our inner senses uh, more, we will uh, realize that uh, the greatest knowledge available uh, to us is within ourselves. And uh, your questions and presence uh, it definitely uh, helped out in terms of trying to um, to, to get that uh, that across. That was the, the whole point was for uh, understanding. And y'all helped out uh, greatly for that and getting me to try to explain certain things that I was overlooking uh, or not seeing where things were missing. So definitely appreciate all of you. Thank you, sir. Thank have you, sir. Yeah. Y'all have a, a good day. And we shall uh, speak soon. Have a good one. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.